Good morning. Hi, Congressman Bonamici, Mary Lurson, and I want to welcome our audience that is with us here for this very important webinar. Um, so thank you all for joining us. I'm Mary Lurson, Executive Director of the NAM Foundation. We have a really uh, important and wonderful webinar ahead with a very special guest who's on camera with us, a Congressman. I have a few opening uh, housekeeping, so please stand by and we'll have a very special introduction for you in a moment as well. Thank you so much. Again, thank you for joining us. Uh, as all of our webinars, I need to just share that we do operate under a very important and serious antitrust uh, policy that we do not uh, share competitive information across the music industry. And thank you for your understanding and respect for that. Details of that are always available for you at nam.org. Also, we do our very best to provide up-to-date information, especially through this complicated COVID year um, about uh, the realities of going back to work and back to our schools safely. Um, but please be advised that we uh, do not presume to offer official financial medical um, information and we uh, or legal information and we encourage you to work with your professionals in that area. So that's in, that's important for you to know as well. We have a remarkable panel with us um, after we'll be hearing from uh, Con Congressman um, Bodamichi, uh, uh, Joff Betts, Jer uh, Jeremy Muffin, Ted Gee, John Malinzak, Cindy Cook, Laura Kay, Mark Wood, all NAM members. We're so uh, thrilled that you are with us and that you're going to share with us the work that you're doing in your community and for schools everywhere. And to kick us off and to inspire us as always is our Joe Lamont, NAM president and CEO. Say hello to say hello to one of our favorite members of Congress. And wow. Well, this is such an incredible morning. I mean, I can't believe so many great NAM members and of course, Congresswoman Bonamici. Um, Mary, thank you for always bringing us together like this. Uh, our partners at Nelson Mellons have done a great job. And of course, all our members who are on today, uh, the front lines and supporting music education in their communities. Um, this is an incredibly important moment, right? As we all work together to safely bring back in-person learning, uh, especially music in the arts. I just read in Sacramento paper this morning that they're finally letting the marching band back on with the spring football season. Um, Look, uh, you know, our children have been through so much this past year, it's heartbreaking, but the crisis has galvanized our resolve to achieve our vision of a world in which every child has a deep desire to learn music and a recognized right to be taught and a world in which every adult is a passionate defender of that right. And there's no one who fits that description of a passionate defender better than Congresswoman Bonamici. Um, we'll be talking with her shortly, and she's going to share her vision uh, of the road ahead and to help us navigate how to get there. So, Mary, again, thank you. So many NAM members are here today, and I just want to express my gratitude for their efforts and how proud we are as NAM to just work side by side with everyone uh, uh, to achieve this important vision. So, thank you, Mary. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Joe. So, now I'd like to turn it over to two of our NAM members. Uh, Joff Metz and Jeremy Murphan from Five Star Guitars in Congressman Bonamici's home district in Oregon. Uh, and I think we've got a wonderful photo of the three of you meeting in Washington, but I turn it over to our, also our 2021 NAM Dealer of the Year, Five Star Guitars, congratulations. Uh, Jeff and Jeremy, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Mary. Um, as lifelong musicians, music educators, and music fans, we can attest to the importance of music education and the impact that it has had on our lives. We believe that access to music education is truly important and the benefits extend far beyond the classroom. As owners of a music store, we see a platform to support the music community. There is no better example of an advocate for music education in the U.S. House of Representatives than our featured speaker. In Congress, she is a leader on the Education and Labor Committee and chair of the Subcommittee on Civil Rights and Human Services. The Congresswoman has long been an advocate for equity in education policy and funding. She is dedicated to setting national policies that give students the support and opportunities they need to succeed in school and in life. We're proud to have her represent us in Oregon's first congressional district and honored to introduce to you, Representative Suzanne Bonamici. 
Well, thank you so much to uh, Joff and Jeremy for that kind introduction to Mary Jo and the National Association of Music Merchants for inviting me to participate in today's event. I, I miss meeting with all of you in person, but I'm glad that we can get together virtually to talk about and celebrate music in our schools. I appreciate so much your continued advocacy and expanding access to music education and for helping to make sure that the next generation is passionate about the arts. We know that the arts, especially music, help us better understand different people, different cultures, give us a way to communicate, inspire creativity, preserve cultures and traditions and transform communities. And importantly, now in this challenging time, soothe us and heal us. The arts have always been important to me and a part of my life. My, my parents were both musical, uh, my mom played the piano, uh, my dad played the drums. He was always drumming on something, the dashboard, the, the table. Uh, and my mom was a piano teacher. I took lessons for a while. Um, they also took my brothers and me to museums, taught us to appreciate music, painting, arts, uh, dance. And I grew up with a, a, an understanding uh, and an appreciation of the important role that arts and arts education play in our society. Now, I, I came to Cong Congress almost 10 years ago now because of my passion for improving public education for all students. You know, here in Oregon, I got involved first as a parent advocate when I found out that my local school, when my own kids were in school, said, where, where's, where's the art teacher? Where's the music class? Where, where's the choir? Um, and so now I serve on the Education and Labor Committee and also on the Science Committee. And, and I note uh, that the role of the federal government in education is, is really about equity and leveling the playing field. A lot of the education laws came about in the civil rights movement. And we know, we know that every student benefits from music and the arts, uh, but too often those opportunities do not exist especially for uh, the underserved communities. So I've consistently sought ways to support music education and expand access for all students and especially those underserved students who benefit so much from the arts. I advocated for provisions in the Every Student Succeeds Act to make sure that students in our K-12 system have access to well-rounded education that includes the arts. And, and that includes the student support and academic enrichment grants, those Title IV-A grants that are so important to making sure that all students have that well-rounded education. And the benefits, we know uh, the benefits to music and arts education, they are many. Uh, they improve student engagement. Research shows that students are more engaged in the classroom when arts, music, and other creative outlets are included in instruction. The arts inspire creativity. Arts education, in particular STEAM, uh, I started the STEAM caucus when I realized that there was a lot of focus on science, technology, engineering, and math. But then in the real world, what employers are looking for is creative, in innovative people who can communicate, and that's what you get from the arts. So I started the STEAM caucus. We know that, that arts education will help students develop the type of knowledge that they'll need to solve the most pressing problems. Uh, of this century and beyond. Arts education helps to build really key skills. And I'll use an example from a STEAM elementary school in Hillsboro, Oregon, which I know Jeff and Jeremy are familiar with, Quatama Elementary School. I met two girls in sixth grade there in a STEAM program where they integrate the arts into their learning. They had made a stop motion animation film to communicate with an audience. They were talking to a bunch of grownups, which is something I couldn't do when I was in sixth grade. They were communicating um, th their understanding of cell division through a stop motion animation film that they made and were narrating. We know that that arts education component of the curriculum helped them develop those communication and public speaking skills that will be valuable regardless of what they do uh, in life. In fact, my own daughter went to an arts magnet school in the Beaverton, Oregon School District, a middle school, high school. Um, she was the, the high school representative to the school board. The, the each, the each high school had a representative to the school board and the school board asked uh, each representative to report how their high school was doing. And my daughter said, I'm in an arts magnet school. So she composed uh, a song uh, and played the piano and sang her report to the school board. Uh, now as an adult, she works in technology and data and she's able to communicate complex topics in creative ways. 
so the arts will help people regardless of where which path they take. So I will always continue to work to support music and arts education. And I'm currently working on a bill we're going to be introducing soon that will expand access to arts education in preschool and early childhood programs, in our K-12 schools, and the focus will especially be on underserved kids, and we'll also expand the research on the value of music and arts education. So I'm excited about that, Bill. Uh, I know that I'm going to be working hard to get it over the finish line. These are and have been, especially over the last year, very challenging times for everyone, including for our nation's young people who are struggling, struggling to cope with this new reality caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. And music education is more important than ever to help people cope and heal. So I'm grateful that the American Rescue Plan, which we passed uh, uh, recently and President Biden signed into law, will provide nearly $130 billion. That's critical funding to our schools uh, to safely reopen. It's particularly important now when states are facing reduced revenue because of the pandemic. We can't let our children's future be on the chopping block. So there's lots of talk about getting back to normal. But we know normal wasn't working for everyone. The pandemic has highlighted uh, and in some ways exacerbated many disparities in our communities and our society. So we can and we should do better than return to the status quo. And COVID relief has been a part of that. Importantly, a portion of the education funding is reserved to address learning loss. So as we move forward, building back better, it's critical that we see music and arts not as an add-on or extra for some, but as essential for all of our students. So my support goes beyond arts education. I'll continue to fight for the arts in our communities as well as in our schools. That means investing in the arts and creative industries that have done so much to boost our economy and doing all we can to help the industry get through the challenges of the pandemic. I know we will succeed with your support and help and advocacy. So thank you so much for the work you do. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you next year, I hope in person. And I wish you and all your families uh, in communities, good health, well-being, and a lot of music. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. It's just so lovely to see you. And um, we do miss being together and, um, Indeed. and all the things that we're able to do when we're in Washington, DC. Uh, thank you for I your remarks. Too. I know. I just, uh, uh, just a few questions. You've given us such a great example of being an advocate. You know, the things, the way you've said it, the passion of your voice. We are an assembly here today of people that are working in their states and local communities as advocates uh, and as teacher advocates as well. Um, and as someone who is obviously receiving a lot of requests, right? A lot of input about what's important. How would you define um, effective advocacy? How, how does the message reach you? What is the components of things that people talk to you about that compel you to actually um, move an issue forward or to work harder on something? Yes, thank you for that question. And, and I tell you what, what really resonates is telling a story. Because when we're talking about policy and making policy and changing laws that create policy, when we speak about it in the abstract, it's not nearly as compelling as when we hear a story about how this has changed people's lives. And I think about the students, like the story I told about the two girls at Kwatama Elementary and, and what that meant to them to be able to have arts integrated education uh, and talk about what it means to a community to be able to have the arts, what it means to students. Uh, I have toured schools, for example, that have, have been uh, touting their great test scores and they got those test scores by cutting everything except what was tested. And the students had no joy. If you walk through a school where students are engaged in, in the arts, you see the joy and passion on their faces. So those the stories about what it means to, to people, um, the people in each, if you're advocating with a, a member of Congress to people in their community and their district, it really makes a difference. Uh, but also invite uh, people to visit 
um, a music class or an arts class. Of course, that might be virtual now, which is not the same, but soon, well, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, invite people to see what it means to be involved in an arts production uh, or, or in a class. Have students communicate uh, in their own words why these classes are meaningful to them. That really resonates uh, from the, the voices. There, there are future leaders. Uh, and uh, hearing their voices and say, this is what it means to me uh, to have the arts. And, and we know you, you all probably spoken with students who say, I go pre-COVID, you know, now I, you know, I go to school or I log on because uh, I have that opportunity. I'm there because I love my, my arts class or my music class or my choir, or my band. Uh, it keeps them motivated and keeps them engaged and shows them a way to, to show individuality and create creativity. Um, you know, the world isn't looking for rote learners right now. We need people who can come up with new ideas and new ways to solve problems. And that all comes from educating both halves of the brain. So, you know, really providing those examples of where music and arts education is missing uh, and how it can be advanced. Um, if there's a district where, for example, if you have arts in some of the schools and not in others, um, that, that's a, a disparity uh, and, and lack of opportunity. And then finally, there are some people who are just convinced by research and data, show them uh, the, the research and data about uh, what happens when students have uh, music and arts in their education uh, and what a difference it makes. It, it, it helps them ben and benefits them in so many ways. Mary, we're not, I'm not hearing you. I'm sorry, you're muted. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. thank you for that. Uh, it's a question that I've asked uh, several of our guests on our webinar series um, is what are you most hopeful for as we move forward? What have we, uh, what have we gathered in our learning baskets and what are you most hopeful for as we move into the post COVID period? Well, thank you, Mary. We, we really need to be hopeful um, for, for our, our communities, for our, our, our students, um, for ourselves. So, so I, I think when, when we look at the American Rescue Plan, for example, um, it, re it creates a, a real opportunity. In fact, Education Secretary Cardona called it a rare opportunity. I'm really excited to see how these funds will be used to support students uh, in sort of the waning days of the pandemic as we're, as we're moving up uh, towards success in the future. And without a doubt, music and the arts should be a key part of these recovery and healing efforts, something that is, is truly woven in and recognized as an important part of, of well-rounded education. And that, that larger relief package also had funds that will help the arts and culture sectors recover. It's been very challenging challenging uh, for any, well, we have the Save Our Stages bill to help, you know, the live venue um, uh, 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 parts of our community, those, the, the people who work in theaters and, and all the teams that, that, that contribute, it's been really tough for them. So seeing artists and musicians being able to get back to work, uh, doing what they love has a tremendous positive effect on our communities and of course, on our children, so uh, I have hope that that uh, I know that we'll we'll get through this, but it has been very very challenging. And I and I tell you, uh, music has has helped so many people, including me. Uh, I listen to music all the time, uh, a, a whole range. And you know, I I grew up outside of Detroit, so I I always loved Motown, but. Uh, you know, I have a cousin, uh, Anthony, who's a classical pianist, and I, I listen to everything from Motown to classical to, um, and, and it's soothing. And, 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 and there's, I, I like music with a message. And so um, that's going to help us get through. And I'm hopeful that, uh, that when, when our, our children are truly back in school, they're, they're uh, engaged and inspired and, and learning, uh, especially with their, their music uh, and arts classes. Thank you so much. Um, love being with you, even it's virtual via Zoom. You're inspiring words and you're inspiring work for all of us here with the US Congress. Uh, we hope to see you. Um, I hope Thank you'll you. join us at the NAM show, slide down the coast to California, January, 2022. We're all working for that time to be together. Uh, and then we'll certainly see you in Washington, D.C. as soon as we can. Thank you so very much. I very much. much look forward to that. Thank you so much, everyone.
Take and care. Thank, and thank you to Joff and Jeremy for your great introduction. And I th I hope as soon as you can, you can all meet up at five, uh, uh, five Star Guitars. That will be a great reunion. I hope so too. It'll be great to get back out there. Thank you. All right. Thanks everyone. Uh, isn't that inspiring to have Congressman Bonamici with us? And thank you all for, uh, again, for being with us for this important gathering. Now we're going to dig in a little bit. I'd like to join, have me join on the on our screen, uh, John Malinzak and Cindy Cook, two NAM members. Uh, John Malinzak is with Hal Leonard and the Note Flight Organization. And uh, Cindy Cook is with Candyland uh, uh, Music in Santa Fe. And both of them are uh, important uh, NAM members to us for their uh, work with, um, uh, and I think we've lost John somewhere, or uh, he will join us as soon as he can, hopefully. Uh, they, um, the work that they have done on the, on the fly and various things that they've helped us, helped us with over the years. Uh, and it's really great, really great to see you. So you are both with us. Mm -hmm on uh, March 2nd at a webinar that we did. This is really part two of our Music in Our Schools Month webinar. And you were with us and you we both went right to work. It was really um, something to hear and to be in touch with you. And why we wanted to have you back on this webinar is that you could really give us an update on what you took away from March 2nd and what you're experiencing in your state, in your regions. So we thought we'd start on the East Coast and Massachusetts is where John is. John, are you with us? And can you give us a give us an update of uh, what your work has been in Massachusetts? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry about the little camera blip. It was working until the second it needed to, like all the virtual stuff. So it's an honor to be here. Mary, thank you to the Congresswoman for all the amazing work. And it was it was really that NAM webinar that, that kicked off. I remember sitting through it. And at the state level, we've been trying to compile all the information that's changing you know daily and we're trying to figure out what we need to do at the local level to get funds to save music programs and keep music strong and nam fund as as, as nam foundation so often does comes in and just outlines the action steps so clearly and so as i was going through that webinar i was taking notes on a google doc because i'm just one of those constant note typers and i looked at the doc and said this looks like homework for our local teachers because I, I just copied what Nam was saying, I was following and tracking. And so I just took the Google Doc and sent it to Massachusetts MMEA. And I'm happy to, to share it in the chat if anyone wants to see and take please, a look. Please, and please. I just turned it into homework and we just shared it with all of our teachers and said, I think you all need to go and do this. And it started at the local level and I'll pop it in right here. And it just said, you know what, we as teachers need to know who to ask for these multiple rounds of funding and how to get it and what to ask for. And I just said, you'll notice it says immediate action. This is your homework. We did a kickoff webinar last Monday that was recorded and we told all teachers in less than 20 minutes, here is your homework. The, you know, the, the government has done their part. The state has done their part. Now there's monies that you need to apply for. Here's what to ask for. And I sent some local leaks and links in there. And we also included some extra credit, which is thanking our state representatives and our state senators for voting to pass all the rounds of funding and thanking our, our local representatives for all that they've done for music. And we've had some really good support from DESE, our, our Department of Education here. So there's lots of thank yous in there. We put in the Arts Are Now links, but we just uh, got to work. And Nam, I have to say, you made it so easy. You gave us our marching orders and we just Put it out to teachers and we're, we're seeing lots of incredible responses so people um, do like you know it's all about a game plan you know run the play as a nam member of the board once said to me you know um so we'd, we'd love to have your webinar link too i think that would be great if, if that's available yes I'll, I'll dig that out i'll share it afterwards i'll look it all up right. on the on the so, website so cindy you've been a, such an active uh, person within your new mexico network you've shared with us over the years what happened to you, to, and you were sharing with us in the hours after that March 2nd webinar, what you were doing with the information. We'd love to hear about uh, what you were doing. Well, many of the same things John did. Um, you know, I just have to say that uh, NAM and the foundation makes it so easy to be a, a champion uh, for for music education advocacy. I kind of look at NAM as my gas tank uh, that gives me power to be able to do what I do. Um, I'm a hands-on owner. Um, 
you know, running a business, not a lot of time left over for other things, but that is really no excuse. Nam makes sure and takes all those excuses away because everything is so well done. And uh, like I said, with the gas tank analogy, I am able to myself uh, put those action items into effect very quickly, but then I can also act as a funnel to uh, people like John said, music teachers, superintendents, principals, uh, our state public education department, um, our, our uh, state arts and, and cultural affairs departments. Um, I just have a really broad network of people that I keep adding to all the time. I have a school board uh, president whose son takes lessons in our program and, um, and she's been very helpful. So uh, being able to have NAM uh, list all of the action items in a very concise and comprehensive way uh, and be able to chip away at those action items. Some of the action items only take a few seconds. Um, you can sign a pledge in 20 seconds. You can send a letter to your state and federal representatives in less than a minute. And so without that uh, resource, I really don't think I would be able to be quite an efficient advocate. So yeah, I wanted to mimic what John said there. So um, yeah, many of the same things in New Mexico, getting the information to as many stakeholders as possible uh, is the goal there and then makes it quite easy to be able to do that. Yeah, I think you were telling us you were communicating with the, with the statewide arts council, giving them information they weren't aware of yet. You know, it's like a kind of you can be the breaking news carrier of a few things just by being connected. You want to just share a little bit of that, um, what you were sharing with us in early March? Well, you guys make me look pretty good oh, like <laughs> here that. on a state level. <laughs> if they only knew. They always appreciate the information. Um, sometimes they don't know about the information or maybe they know, but they don't know how to access it and how to take action for it. And so, um, yeah, so I shared with you guys, thank you so much for making me look like a valuable resource in my community and my state. Uh, if I was left to my own regard, th there's no way I would be able to be uh, as an effective advocate. Uh, there's just so many tools and information and research and resources that I basically, like I said, I'm, I'm just the big funnel that is able to distribute. And I think the people that I have um, accumulated in my network um, may have been a little skeptical in the beginning about what's her motivation here, what is she doing, but now they all trust me and they look forward to my emails and they look forward to the information and they're so very appreciative uh, for me sending that to them. And uh, for example, my music uh, coordinator at our public schools really relies on me to give her information that's easily digestible uh, for her to be able to share with all of the music educators um, in her district. So uh, yeah, thanks for making me look good, Nam. <laughs> I think you are absolutely sharing the essence of effective advocacy. You know, you and John's, John's nodding his head. Would you agree, John? It's, you know, and having a reliable source, we are all together a network of a reliable source. And this is a best practice sharing network too, right? I mean, uh, we get ideas, we get the right information, we move it out in sort of a uniformed way. John, what's been your reaction from your network over time? Oh, absolutely. You know, you know Cindy, it's so great to hear what's what's happened on the other side of the coast because it's, it's so much. We're just communicating the same stuff over and over, but people need to hear it. And there's so much information out there. The more we can communicate the great work NAM is doing, people just are so hungry for it. And then they come back to you, you know. So now that we've been communicating a lot, we get emails every single day just from teachers asking for information and now you're a source and you're flipping information through, which is fantastic. I also um Mary, I also wanted to share about, you know, there's a there's a cross industry NAM, you know, member uh, project called the post pandemic planning guide and Yamaha has been involved, how has been involved, um, Marsha Neal, Bob Morris and Amra music and some great educators. And this is a committee that's putting together all this information and pushing it out from anyone who will possibly create it. And I'll just pop a link in the chat as well to that. And 
it's another way that we're trying to just communicate all the information. Um, volume six that's about to come up has all the information about how to apply for your ESSER funding. And we're just communicating the information that people need as many different ways as possible. And it's, it's really been great to see all of the industry just work together for one call. So that's what we've always done as advocates. But now that we really get to you know go in, in high speed, it's super fun to connect with so many other NAM members and just help get this information out. I have to tell you, it's been really amazing watching this post-COVID process being uh, kind of unfolding because it's like we've got a, a we've got tiers of information moving now. It's really it's really wonderful. Um, now hold on to your seatbelts. We're going to post a lot of stuff in the chat for anyone that's interested. This all really got launched at the Believe in Music with the Arts Our Education campaign, and that is still ongoing. So you can write to your state representative. You can write to your member of Congress. That's a link. You can get a lot of the core language of this whole uh, this campaign. And now we're gonna give you all the money information, all right? So there was a CARES 1, which is like 14 billion, CARES 2, about 54 billion, and the relief funding that just came through at 129 billion for K-12 education folks of where music education is. And today, March 25, you should be planning your summer music camps, no charge, fee, hiring teachers, hiring artists in your communities. We got to get two years of beginner started this summer. Uh, and this is where you need to start working with school administration to get these camps organized, get extra teachers, get community artists come in and do work with students. It's just, uh, um, I, I don't know if we'll see this level of funding uh, in our lifetime again. This is a really, and we have to uh, request it. We have to advocate for it. Last question to you and John and um, Cindy. What are you seeing state and locally? What are you seeing in terms of the narrowing of opportunities because of COVID or the expanding of opportunities because of COVID? We're gonna have the rest of our uh, webinar devoted to the transition to online and to, to back to school and, and questions about how this new technology has changed music learning. But what are you hearing locally that maybe it concerns you and also excites you? John? Well, what concerns me is that, oh, were you supposed to go, John? I'm sorry. <laughs> well, what concerns me in New Mexico is that um, music education in the pandemic um, tends to not be on an equal playing field as some of the other things when it comes to kids getting back in the classroom and being able to make music together. For example, sports was able to start a, a few weeks ago, full on, if you're in football, full on tackle, you don't have to wear a mask. Uh, yesterday, uh, we were given the go ahead to resume music classes and band classes, uh, but it had to be outside. All the kids have to be separated nine feet, not six feet or three feet. Um, and it's, you know, it's just, um, it just doesn't feel equitable, especially with the research done from uh, the University of Colorado and all of the research that's been shown how to how kids can safely play music in a school setting. And so that's concerning to me. And I don't know where the nine feet came from. There's not much of an opportunity to have a seat at the table uh, with concern to helping develop uh, those safeguards for music classes. Um, and I talked to a school music teacher last night in one of our schools here locally, who it was her first day uh, back being able to teach kids. Um, she had to find a place on the playground. She had to get them out there safely and back safely and make sure they're all separated nine feet apart. But she also, there's kids whose parents aren't ready for them to come back to class yet. So she had to lug her computer out <laughs> to the playground as well to include the people that are, are tuning in online. And you can imagine the logistics of trying to get in a, a cohesive band together. So that's still worrisome to me uh, concerning uh, the, the research that is a perfect model to be allowed uh, to be able to have kids play music together. Um, so I just, I need to do a better job as an advocate to try to get information to the people who are making these kind of policies in, in a pandemic. Um, I've also heard from teachers that if we hadn't had the pandemic, they wouldn't have had such empathy for their students. For example, one teacher said, um, you know, this, this one kid, it's just a pain in my neck. Um, 
during the school year, well, he was invited into this child's home through doing Zoom classes and saw what, you know, what this, this student's home life is. So he has much more empathy for the student and has sort of uh, a resurgence of joy in teaching because it made uh, his student a little more human to him. And I'm hearing those stories over and over as well. Wow, that's, that's really remarkable. You know, concerning the, uh, the outside guidelines, uh, we'll make sure that the CDC information reaches you. You know, it's, it's, we really can't go higher than that in terms of having a redo and an endorsement, uh, but it is re being interpreted differently in, on the community level. And uh, we just have to keep pushing. John, how about you? What are you saying locally? Right, I think the, the community level interpretation is key. I mean, this is equity and access all over again. This is something we've advocated for for years and years and years. And here we are as we as school districts are thinking about returning. We're seeing lots of scheduling. We're seeing learning loss, extended learning. Are we going to add 30 days here? Are we going to add a half hour every day there? We already have one district who is um, committed. We're still fighting as, as hard as we can as a state organization. We have one district that has extended learning time after school, which they've pushed the arts to that. And they're using in, you know, during school time for different things, which of course we're saying is a cut because there's the, once it's after school and extra and extra transportation, et cetera, it becomes a, a cut in the arts and ac not equitable access. And we're seeing more and more of those happen. So we're encouraging all of our teachers to you know, get in the conversation. It's really hard to fight a decision that has been made. It's a lot easier to influence a decision. So what we're screaming from the mountaintops is teachers, and I would say everyone watching, if you know an educator, have them, everyone in every district needs to be at the table. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu, at the budgeting table, at the learning loss table, at the what does scheduling look like when we get back? Is it extended learning? Are we doing what does that look like and making sure that music is still part of that because we fought so hard for so long to have equal access and well-rounded education include music and that needs to continue and so we're just trying to get at the table as soon as possible so we're not finding out about last minute decisions in august and then you know it's really really hard to overturn those decisions but it's a lot easier to influence those decisions um, but we're seeing a lot of that at the local level, and it's a lot of the same conversations. Every district is having the same conversation internally. So we're trying to have a network of, has this district made the decision? Okay, you need to talk to so-and-so because they've already thought this out and realized that music is important. So we're trying to also match people up so we can be efficient as well. And really helping each other. And remember, our students need this now more than ever as they come back to school. We're going to let you go. I could talk to you all day about advocacy. I could get inspired by both of you all day. Um, and, you know, maybe we should just do that all by ourselves without all 100 people listening. But uh, thank you so very much for all that you're doing. Really, really great. And right back at you, Mary. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we want to turn our, our conversation a bit to what we know has been holding us together this, uh, this entire year. It's been amazing that it's been a year, but this entire year that we have been meeting in this virtual space and we've been music learning in this virtual space as well. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Ted Gee, the uh, founder owner of um, Live Music Tutor. Ted, we've had a chance to chat with you a bit during this year. Um, you, I'd love to hear uh, just a quick over how long has Live Music Tutor been in business? Yes, thank you, Mary. And, you know, it's great to be part of the NAM family and really continue to help support music education and really access to all. But Live Music Tutor uh, began its journey in 2011, so almost 10 years old uh, now. And uh, we were, we basically created a, a technology that was built for music education. And we focus primarily on the visual and sound requirements of music to be able to provide uh, to not only the uh, thousands of instructors and learning uh, teaching artists that we have, but also for the students. So then something happened this year. Something happened that, that turned Live Music Tutor into a interesting um, supplemental experience possibly to the in-person instruction to the only option that we all of us had. So tell us what this last, last year has been like, all leading to the question of what is the, as we move to the aftertime, how will this technology 
continue to interact with the in-person uh, learning experience. So tell us about this year for you. Yeah, uh, this year has been very interesting. Uh, our business has grown uh, almost about 3000%, but the bigger issue was that before the pandemic, there was a lot of reluctance and learning that was required uh, to really understand uh, or even have acceptance for online education and making sure, number one, that we were not replacing uh, the teachers in the classroom or taking jobs away. What the pandemic has done is that it has forced everyone to really look at online education and its uses. Uh, fortunately, unfortunately, uh, we have heard tons of stories about schools and districts where kids were not able to perform, you know, thereby impacting those issues. So we've continued to try to help, uh, not only with, uh, you know, as much as we can with schools with the online services, but also to it be inclusive of the underserved areas and some of the kids that were really getting left behind. So we felt that the uh, challenges that we were hearing from uh, teachers all across the country and some of the students was some of the uh, quality issues, some of the privacy issues of the technology that they were having, uh, some of the, you know, some of the Zoom bombing issues. And we spent a lot of time trying to educate on different types of quality uh, technology that's available. And one of the things that we became most proud of, and we think that have been accepted really well, is that we've just releasing a technology that will get us to virtual performance and virtual rehearsals. And we're running a pilot now, we're preparing to run a pilot now with a couple of higher ed uh, uh, institutions. And we think that uh, technology as a whole will continue to be a part of education and definitely a part of uh, the opportunity to reach more or provide more access to all kids. And uh, even whether it's a, a hybrid solution or whether it's uh, for many schools that will remain uh, virtually, uh, it would be an opportunity for them not to take just basic music lessons, but they'll be able to do uh, performances, uh, additional music classes that will be more engaging than just a traditional online learning. So you're, you actually are addressing the issue of latency, right? That we've yes. all, we have all uh, lived through and our, uh, you know, we perform one, we perform with each other on mute, right? Is how yes, we, yes, right? yes. So you, yes. that's very yeah. interesting. Go ahead, I'm sorry. So, um, so, it's, so from your perspective of before COVID, with a, um, a, an experience, a learning experience that was really valued and it was increasingly valued by our in-school music educators is my understanding, right? I mean, our, right. our, our in-school music, we're seeing it as really as a quality supplemental instruction, right? That was- Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And essentially it's because of all of the uh, music educators and the, uh, the, the, the performing artists, the teaching artists, that we were able to continue modifying our technology. We were getting feedback for things that they wanted to do with the visual and sound, some that we hadn't really had on our development platform, but it was because of the, uh, the feedback of the music educators really across the country and the, and the, uh, the teaching artists that gave us input into the development that really helped us to get to the level of uh, quality of technology that we have today. So you see that, and this is my final question, Ted, you see that the uh, post COVID period will be a parallel with robust in-person learning in school with state-of-the-art online support and supplemental learning. Um, available and continuing to improve. Is that your vision? Of absolutely, absolutely. And I think that, and I think Cindy mentioned this earlier, but uh, you know, some of the kids and some of the programs may have slipped uh, just because of this time period. And I think that online learning to supplement programs to really help with, uh, you know, uh, some 
supplemental opportunities for kids to learn or perform in conjunction with the normal classes uh, will be a huge advantage to many of the students that uh, are in music programs or need to be in music programs as well. You know, I go back to my own life and uh, the start of my career as a music educator. And I think that, you know, having to be teaching all the instruments and if I knew that I could send some, some students off to a six week or, you know, semester long tutorial, that I would have been a much better violin teacher in 19, yes. <laughs> 19 whatever it was, uh, then, uh, and I would have given those children a much better experience. And I think that this world has opened up our eyes to the individuality of teaching that we can do online, meeting students' needs in a more individualistic way. Uh, and then maybe more of us are less timid about the technology, so. Yes. And, you know, Mary, I think one of the uh, additional benefits is that now many schools are able to not only share performances. So we have master classes and clinics that we're doing with professional artists, teaching artists, as well as some of our instructors. And now we can have multiple schools look at this performance or these master classes and clinics without the expense always of having the folks come to the one particular area and they can combine and share with different schools within the district through the technology so that more kids will be able to see the master classes, the clinics and really enjoy the experience without all of the excess expense. And at the end of the day, more people playing music at a level that they want to tr strive for and achieve reaching out, getting more input and help. You know, I only see uh, a more of an upside. In fact, I might have to log on to improve my uh, ukulele skills. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We've got thousands of great teachers, but yes. Yeah, thank, um, you so we're excited. Very, thank you so very much. And we're great to know you're out there still working, perfecting this great resource. Thanks, Ted. Thank you, Mary. Thanks to the NAM family. And, you know, we'll keep, keep helping to provide access. Great, thank you so much. Um, All right. Thanks. And I'm so thrilled to have with us Vice President of the Mark Wood Music Foundation, Laura Kay, and owner founder of Mark Woods of Electrify Your Symphony. As I was explaining it to my team the other day, enough energy to break the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Good, just, then we're doing our job. Yes. Just, thrilled to see you. Um, so sorry not to see you in person. Always some of the best hugs at the NAM show every year. It's just lovely to have you with us. and. You know, I, I love uh, because you're so you spend so much of your life out there as a touring musician, as a touring artist. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to start my questions to you. What was the moment like when you realized this was all going to change? Where were you? How did you address the existential threat of not being out with people and, and students and engaging them in your, your innovation? Uh, so who wants to start with that question, looking back at the well, I think that the, it was, to say the least, devastating for our entire music yeah. industry, not only the dealers and our wonderful teachers, but our musicians. We had no work and, and our work is our pleasure. Our work is our mission, our purpose. So it's been a tremendously eye-opening, um, enlightening moment too, by the way. And I don't know if you guys know that we actually are musicians who travel physically, get on an airplane, and we go everywhere where there's a school and a music program to help. And listening to these great uh, panelists and our wonderful Congresswoman, it does take a village. We all are contributing certain things to the um, health and support of our music programs. And we're musicians, so we provide something that's really interesting because we provide the exposure to magic the magic of music, not just pushing buttons and curriculum specifically, even though we do teacher training, we have our own curriculum, but to be in a live stage with a child who's never heard applause, a child who really is incorporate, who's dealing with self issues and confidence, we're standing right next to them. And we're not there just for the concert, we're there for the entire week of a residency. We're meeting with the principals, the administrators, the town leaders, we're meeting with the dealers, we're bringing everybody together for these moments of our residency, and it's creating a huge impact where the ripple effect is for months. 
and we find that we show the kids, you know, when, when we all grew up with music, we always had our favorite band, our favorite musician, our favorite composers to inspire and motivate us. So when we go to the schools, we're with them for hours every day talking to them. So it's very, really been a great, great 21 years we've been doing this. It's fueled yeah. by our nonprofit. And um, we're talking hundreds of thousands of students per year that we're able to address. All the profits from the concerts go back into the music programs so that the, the school pro music programs are funded because unfortunately they're challenged by that. We all know that. So we're going to come and help. We play 1,000 seat, 2,000 seat auditoriums. The entire com uh, town comes. The media is there filming us. We're interviewed and we talk about the power of music. And that I think is the first stimulus motivator for any person is the love of music. Let's harness that and then let's bring the technology, all the curriculum, teacher training that we do. Creative intelligence is critically important. I know the Congresswoman spoke about the importance of creative intelligence. We also do emotional tech. We talk to the kids that they're not just sawing on their violin. Like I do the orchestra, Laura does the choir. We have people who do the band. We have people who do the rock band people. But we always talk about we're not just sawing, we're not just singing, we're singing magic. We're connecting our hearts to the audience. That is what we do. And that's the learning experience that sports has a whole different learning examples, but sports don't apply that. We can't cry in football, ladies and gentlemen, but we can cry in music. We can't cry in biology. We, you know, so the emotional aspect of music is such a critical topic that we talk about. So yeah, we've been doing this for a long time. They uh, select students come to our camp. It's just awesome. So then I'm going to say to Laura, then it all stopped, Laura. What yeah. happened? How did yeah. you invent that energy into your online studio? Insane. Like for you? So all of that is, yeah, we sent some pictures to Nam so that you guys could get an idea of what all of this looked like before COVID. So last March, we're in Tucson, Arizona, getting ready to do two enormous programs with, with um, orchestra students, first in Tucson and then in Phoenix. And at the 11th hour, they keep talking. It's like, oh, it's still gonna happen. It's still gonna happen. It's still gonna happen. And we're all watching the news and we're all like biting our fingernails. And then the world just stopped. We were stranded. We were stuck in a hotel room in Gilbert, Arizona. And I think Mark and I, I think Mark, we allowed ourselves about an hour to like cower in the corner oh, of the scream, hotel room, scream. screaming and crying <laughs> and railing as we watched emails flooding and going, I think we're gonna cancel this year. Yep, we're gonna cancel, we're gonna cancel. And, and the world just exploded for us. So after that hour, we scrape ourselves up off the floor, but we're creative people. So if, as creative people, we think creatively and you know, Mark's dad, when 9-11 happened, said two words that really define our whole philosophy, destruction, construction. Think about that for a second. It's like, OK, so the world is exploding with COVID and this everything is, is our world is shutting down. How do we bring something positive to the table? How do we pioneer the possibilities? So what we did was essentially we have an annual rock orchestra camp that we do. Uh, last year was our 11th year. And we decided let's move forward with that. Let's do it as a two week online experience and throw every idea we could think of at the wall to see what would stick. And interestingly enough, quite a bit of it stuck. And um, long story short, at the end of it, we send out a survey to our campers and almost everyone was like, even when we go back to in-person, you've got to keep an online component, which I'll get to in a minute about the importance of integrating that online component and what we've learned from this. Um, you know, during our, our session the other day, actually Ted Gee was talking a lot about individualized learning and how the on, and I wanna address that because what we do when, when you're working in the framework of this box the kid who's in the back row of the orchestra or the or hiding behind everybody on the top choir riser who thinks nobody can see them in this environment we can all see you and so in this environment we need to help empower them with skills that work with this technology and right now so we all know that there's no substitute for in-person concerts right but we have to get kids collaborating on something we have to get them invested in something that they can own and so what we have morphed into 
is creating these music videos, um, which we have a little clip that we can show at the end of this um, that, that I sent to you guys to show what we've been doing. And they're not just like, we've all seen like the virtual concert videos with a whole bunch of boxes and kids are just standing there. Might as well just be looking at a picture. What we're doing is we have performance workshops with me where I try to get into the kids' heads and get them what to identify the things that hold them back, to show me who your audience is. This is your new audience. So how do we play to this audience? And, and really talking to them like real talk, like you feel horrible about the pandemic? So do I. I feel like a limb has been cut off my body that I can't perform on stage. But show me how that feels. Like Mark mentioned, connect emotionally, connecting emotionally with your music. And especially when you're in this environment, how do you smile when you play? How do you position the camera? How do you, we have a choreographer and a movement coach. Um, so we do all of this stuff. So it's about rehearsals and workshops and individualized learning. That's what Ted had said the other day. That's so, so important. So, hey, and it can, really, yeah. I just wanna, you know, just, drill a little bit into this have you then once you pass into your you're going to do this are you like hyper busy are you doing this every day oh <laughs> i mean yes I mean, I, you know we want we want to see get a sense of it went from getting on planes and walking into venues and right stage managers and, da, 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 and now you haven't gone anywhere in 10 months and you have this you look great on camera by the way whatever you <laughs> do, i want more of that okay so you're so you're writing you, are you busy doing this? Oh, Mary, we're doing yeah. eight to 10 master classes a day. I'm going from San Antonio to Florida to California to Ohio to Wisconsin. And by the way, I am wearing pants. And I've been wearing <laughs> pants all year. So am I. Uh, yep. I'm not wearing shoes, but I'm wearing pants. <laughs> and um, we have a very, it's a 30 minute master classes. And we're talking about the music that they're about to learn for the video YouTube that we're going to produce for them. We've got five editors full time working on us. I'm mixing all the tracks. They're all doing clap clicks so that we can line the audio up. Uh, and we have schools from 500 students, singers, band people, drummers and violin string players. And it's really, really been fun. And they're learning the very shy kids who in the classroom sort of hide behind the more aggressive kids on the Zooms, they're very relaxed in their safe zone in their room. So I can so, talk to little Joey. So better, you, got, you, know? you, you, you got the, you, re, you reconfigured the Mark Woods, Laura K yeah. Enterprise, right? You, all, you, you, re, you got the word out, you started scheduling, you obviously had a little bit of a shopping cart there, right? Because, you know, yeah. right? so you got that going and then, and now, what are you going to do next? You're going to start. Are you, are you booking uh, Kalamazoo? Have you booked Kalamazoo? Oh, yeah. We're, in your, in we your... are starting. We're so excited to say that we're starting to book in person in the fall. Mark and I are each halfway vaccinated. So we're, we're, we're getting much, much closer to that. Um, but schools, we just worked with a school last week. I can't remember. Uh, oh, one of these educators that are, that we've been working with from a little town. It, is it in um, uh, uh, Tennessee? Um, oh yeah, Johnson City. Susan, Johnson City. So this teacher, she, we're doing, I think four or five songs with her high school and her middle school, and we're doing almost daily online rehearsals and, and storyboarding because we have the kids come up with a storyline for the video. It has to be something that they can own. Um, and so she's booked us for next year, but has the what, how she's booked us is she wants us to come in virtually several times a month to coach the kids and get them ready so that when we're there in person, the, the, the um, visit will have that much more impact. So it's really, I, I mean, I'll say it took a long time to get the word out to get it off the ground. But the last couple of months, we've been, like Mark said, eight hours a day visiting schools left and right. And I don't see that ending. I see that going into the future as well. I don't know if Bethany wants to show a little sample of some of the videos that we've been producing. Because we're running a little bit over, we're going to show it at the end. All right. I oh, just, okay. I know, I'll, but we'll definitely show it. We'll do it as a trailer at the end. But so what I'm what I'm uh, hearing you're saying is that uh, is this it jumps off of Ted's conversation too. Is that um, it is actually accelerating the experience, and it actually for many yeah. students is giving them an individualized and deeper experience. 
how can this be not good? Right. Well, how, like Ted said, right. Ted said is providing more access to more kids. So when you're right. in this kind of an online thing, it, you know, and, and we're working with schools that are hybrid. We're working with schools that are strictly online. There have been a couple of schools that have been in classrooms with masks that they've put us on a screen. But however you can get to deliver the message is such an important thing. Um, and, and getting the kids to feel like they're being seen and heard, which we do in person. We, we always know how to zero in on the kids that need it the most. Well, in this environment, you can really see them. And so we continue that as well. So yeah, it's, it's, I, I, think, it's, I think that this is here to stay. And, and I like that because there's so many positives about that individual experience and about coaching and about that kid who's in the back who thinks that nobody notices them or cares that you know, I, we I, see I, you. I, uh, I love and admire you for so many reasons. Um, you know, I think the top one being that you are really artists, right? You have the artist sensibility about you. Uh, you're you know, really committed teacher. So I, I, my final question is, Hannah, what did you, what did this year teach you? You know, what did it teach you in the most essence and purest way? You know, Mary, I, I'm so glad you asked me. And very briefly, it was very emotional for us. It's very emotional for us to connect with kids who are dealing with the pandemic. <clears throat> and it's emotional for us too, uh, to the point where we talk very openly and honestly to them as though they're in the room. And I think that that really was a great experience for us. These kids, and mostly the parents, we hear from the parents. My kid has been struggling all year with this pandemic of every subject. And if you didn't bring Mark and Laura in, the music program would have really been decimated. Bringing us in woke up these children and it became emotional. It became like, wow, we're doing this kids. Yeah, look at me in the eye and we get your instrument up and we're gonna get you to play even better. We do these drills with them. We do these links. Here's click on the Zoom link of the rehearsal we just did and practice every day to it so that we don't lose and we are losing a lot of our players by not playing all year. So it's been very interesting. It is very emotional, like Mark said, but you know, the mental health aspect of making music cannot be yeah. understated. Um, so I speak from personal experience, music saved my life. Um, and I, I just, Mark and I seem to both have that knack for, for finding the kid who needs that lifeline and speaking to them plainly um, in a way, instead of saying, oh, it's all going to be okay. Life is going to be okay. It's like, no, it stinks what we're going through this year. Let's actually have a conversation about that. And now let's channel all of that into your making music. And it's everything that we do is about empowering and having kids own the spotlight. And like uh, Congresswoman Bonamici said about creating leaders, you know, America, we always complain that we have a lack of creative thinkers in this country. Well, that's because music and arts keeps getting cut at such an alarming rate. The more musicians, and we don't mean career musicians, but if music is part of your life, I mean, heck, Albert Einstein, the smartest guy on the planet, played the violin and music enhanced it. Mark shows that a slide of that at every performance hang that he does with schools where he performs and talks about his life and his career. It, it's so it's so critically important to have that outlet as an artist because this is what's going to create scientists. This is what's going to create brilliant mathematicians. This is what's going to create brilliant, creative, leading thinkers. Yep. So is music. So we have to, we have, thank you so much, Nam, for your yeah, advocacy. Who supported us is, for years. Is, yeah. If only Einstein knew how to play a viper. Just <laughs> right? Let's bring all of our panelists back on. There's the viper. Oh, just think if, if only Einstein <laughs> could have had that. Um, panelists, it's, it's great to see you. You've all made such a wonderful contribution. Um, I just, uh, and thank you to our Oregon AM members for introducing our important guest. Uh, I did want uh, Five Star Guitars to have a moment to tell us what you're doing in Oregon, though, with your state, with your advocacy efforts. Uh, I'd love to have you share. Jeremy, would that be you? Um, sure, yeah. Uh, locally, I am on the board of directors for the Chamber of Commerce. So, um, so my engagement ha is kind of twofold. Usually it has to do with small business advocacy, which is, um, you know, all of us. And then specifically the connecting NAM to local and, and state legislators that are, um, 
that is and, and a lot of the the conversations i have are around education and so for me connecting all of those dots it, it's like a web as opposed to like there's a silo of education and a silo of small business and it's 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 not you know social and emotional development of kids goes hand in hand with their cognitive development and um and the mental health issues that kids are dealing with during the pandemic were there before and they just kind of got exacerbated and um and you know it's a personal belief of mine but um but statistics show that music is one of the best ways to deal with mental health and so bringing it back just can't happen soon enough in in our schools thank, thank you so much um so again we always like to give our panelists a chance for final thoughts jeremy if it's all right we'll We'll say that's your final thought, if that's okay. Uh, um, Joff, we'd love to hear your final thoughts. It just gives a chance to thank you and uh, let you um, share some final thoughts with us. Um, well, thanks for having us. And uh, yeah, I mean, we're, uh, we're doing what we can to spread the word, you know, like beyond the uh, NAM fly-ins. Uh, Jeremy and I met with the Hillsborough School District and, uh, and spoke with them a little bit about some of those programs. and. We're going to try to see if, if we can get to our state legislators, you know, see if we can get a meeting in Salem. Um, you know, I feel like there are a number of things that we can be doing. Um, and, and the biggest thing seems to be just awareness of some of those programs that we're, uh, you know, sort of advocating for. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that, that's sort of, of our plan. And although, uh, you know, as COVID kind of winds down it's time to to get back engaged you know it's time to get the, those um those combos playing outside the front of the store again and right down the street. <laughs> yeah that, that too yeah right it's time for live music please more live music indeed uh ted, ted your final thoughts and thanks so much for being with us yeah this has been awesome and and one of the things that i've always appreciated and know that you and eric and joe and everybody in the in the nam team has been very helpful and we've been using utilizing a lot of the the brochures pre-pandemic one of the things that we believe here in some of the negatives of the technology is somehow we want to make sure that people know that there what there is a platform that was built for music and so some of the negative experiences that they may have had, that there's some kind of way that we can overcome them. And I think Laura, Cindy, everybody was kind of saying the same thing. This is going to be here to stay uh, at some level. And I think because of that, we've got to figure out how to address the people whose experience wasn't as optimal as everyone else's. And I don't know whether that's you know, additional you know, pamphlets or information or something, but, uh, but people need to know that in addition to NAM, that we and everyone else here are supporters of, uh, pulled out my, my thing here, but everyone else is supportive of the journey. That's here to, to continue. Okay. And there we go with the technology thing again. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Ted. Really great to have you. Um, uh, oh. Help us from uh, uh, New Mexico, your final thoughts. Cindy. I would say that um, it's been six years now since the Every Student Succeeds Act was passed, making music as part of a well-rounded education for the first time in federal law. Six years um, later, I would have thought that um, every school district, everybody, everybody would have um, known how to access funds, pull them down for their schools and their programs. I would have thought by now that um, music isn't on the peripheral, it would be streamlined. So I would just implore everybody who's watching, uh, if you're only doing a, a tiny bit of advocacy or if you haven't started, we really need everybody in every state to reach every school district these stories have been phenomenal all the way from the congresswoman clear through to, to mark and laura who do amazing things in this world and see and experience uh the power of music and not only the lives of children but adults as well so i would just say everybody log on to nam.org 
click on the issues and answers tab and next to that is the music education tab just check out what the current call to action is uh, maybe today just look at the website maybe tomorrow sign a pledge takes you 30 seconds maybe the day after that send one letter to your congress uh, people um, and your lawmakers and you'll find it only takes a minute just do something and help all of us all of these champions of music education uh, nam really is the gas tank to make you a powerful advocate and like joe said um, at the beginning um, what the nam's vision is we can all be uh, fighting for the right for every child to be able to have music education in their life so so go to nam.org <laughs> thank you cindy beautifully said yes yeah, so if we all do one thing we can make 10 things change by doing that one thing it's great uh, uh, John from Massachusetts. Absolutely. You know, we've heard time and time again for the past year how many ways we have found to continue to reach students and in fact reach students in ways never before possible where they feel more comfortable and more safe at home trying something new instead of in class in front of everyone else. And we found many ways to use video and audio to engage students. And I think the ultimate goal, not to uh, quote Joe Lamont right in front of him, but the, the ultimate goal is getting more students making music, more students staying in music. For the past year, we've discovered ways to get students making music and staying in music using technology to collaborate. And that doesn't go away. So when we go into August and beyond, my passion, my plea is August 2021 needs to look better for music education than February 2020 does. We have so many more tools in our toolbox. We have so many more resources. We have so many more skills. We have so much more money from the federal level to put to this. Let's reach more students, whether it's at home, in school, in a room, in a Zoom. It doesn't matter. We have every tool possible and we, we owe it to every innovator and every person who's worked in the past year Year to to get to keep music going to make August 2021 stronger and grow from there. Music education in a room or in a Zoom. I think we we need a soundtrack to that. I'm assigning Mark Wood and Laura Gay. <laughs> right. We in music education in a room in a Zoom. Da, 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 I da. can hear a song in my head right I now. Know. Let's just go. All right, Mark and Laura, your final thoughts, <laughs> and we'll, we'll wrap up with Joe. Excellent. Well, I'm hoping we could show our little video of the YouTube that we're there making with the schools, but um, I can't thank everybody enough. I think that the takes a village. I think that um, Cindy said it very eloquently. In the past six years, we expected music education to be on the forefront and to be uh, the leader in that. And we are unfortunately have not seen that. I think the prior administrations fumbled with that. I'm really believing that I have optimism. The new administration is really going to address our education needs, especially our music. So cross your fingers, everybody. Let's get everybody involved. Thanks. Yes, Mark. we we are proud and thrilled to be part of NAM for what, 25, 30 yeah, years? 20, I don't know. We've been, we've been members been for 25 years. NAM members for feels like forever. Uh, Cindy, you uh, you could not have said it any better that NAM is the gas tank. Yes. That NAM and, and, and encouraging people, I just want to echo your words. Go to NAM's website, find all these resources. You know, when we first signed up to do the NAM fly in advocacy, we we're like, oh my God, that's going to be so much work. It was so empowering. It was such an amazing thing to just take little steps to just learn. It doesn't take much, but any action is better than no action. Um, and especially when it comes to music education, we, you know, if you're going to cry and whine about it without taking action well you have to do something it's like this is about the future of our generations and of of our society and about our planet and uh and bravo to all of you what incredible work this this yeah. whole panel of people is doing just i want to applaud you all yes. really and and we are going to show your video uh, right after a few announcements and right after joe gives us a final thought joe uh, no i can only add that you know Suzanne Bonamici told us the secret, which is storytelling. And each one of you are incredible storytellers. And our our vision is about storytelling of the young people's lives that are changed. Um, it's just, there's a lot of work to do. And Cindy doesn't stay fixed. It's like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. You get done on one end, you got to start on the other and paint all over again. This just never stays fixed. And that's our life's work, right? Uh, and last word, Ted, I'd like to talk to you about how to grow 3,000%. I could use a little bit of that. <laughs> mind. So uh, I'll be contacting right? you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll have what he's having. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, me too. <laughs> right. Well, speaking of grow, growing 1,000%, thank you for inspiring all of us. You're wonderful. A couple quick announcements. In 24 hours, you all can come back for another congressional briefing. Our good friends at NAFME are doing a, a Hill presentation in, in collaboration with Senator John Tester. Uh, and, and that's tomorrow, the 24th, uh, do you see the slide 12 noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, and that's gonna really talk about the role of music and social emotional learning and uh, social emotional well-being uh, for all of our children as they're moving through this post-COVID period. Also announcing tomorrow is a very important new initiative called Arts Ed Cell, S-E-L. It's the Center for Arts Education and Social Emotional Learning, a brand new national resource that is coming online. Um, we're very grateful to collaborate uh, with that effort and that'll be talked about tomorrow at that congressional briefing. And also at the end of May, we won't be meeting with in Washington DC, but we will be having an, a virtual fly-in please save the date for Tuesday, May 25. And we're also uh, just later, uh, end, of, end of this year, uh, end of this week, we're launching a series of online ukulele symposiums really remarkable work. And we know that um, that as we re-enter school, we need to be offering a broader curriculum, more curriculum. We might not be able to be blowing instruments right away, but we can be sitting six feet apart and playing a mighty ukulele. So we are uh, supporting the music education field with this online. It debuts on uh, this week, and then a new series will be presented every month, all available at NAMP Foundation. Thank you, our panelists. Boy, you're mighty. And let's all stay tuned for this remarkable closing video from the uh, Electrify Your Strings and the Mark Woods Foundation. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Let's make sure our NAM team comes up. Hello, our great production team, Claire, Eric, Beth, and Jeep. We always love seeing you to thank you. And thanks everybody for joining us. Lovely to have you. Please share of the taping of this webinar far and wide so we can share this inspiration. Enough energy to break the internet. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.